In a space too far from anything to be nothing, a blue light shines into the void. Through the shadow, shapes appear. People, stories, wonders, and mysteries. Live from Elgin, Illinois, it's Tales from the Blue Light with special guest, Rich Perez. We're doing something a little different today than what you might be used to here at the Blue Box Cafe. Well, people are often up here discussing stories. Today, we're going to be creating them. Uh, what this show is about is stories and storytelling. Uh, Rich here is a storyteller with us, and I'm going to be here telling you those stories. So let's put you guys in the right place. Welcome to the first ever episode of Tales from the Blue Light. I am your host, James Wilder. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we're here together in a liminal space. You may not know what a liminal space is, so I'll take a moment to explain it. A liminal space is a space between reality and the other. A place where what we expect of the world isn't quite right. In short, it's a place where stories become real. If you've ever walked alone at Walmart when the lights flickered, the floor seeming too white and the tiles on the ceiling to become an incorrect sky, or you're walking at night and saw a shape that could have been a monstrous dog or a many-fanged beast, or a person, but who's to judge, only for it to slip away into the night? Or, well, you've been in a liminal space before. This is where all the ideas we've had about what makes a story and what makes a story ours run into each other and we're forced to question if what we imagined under the bed was there or not. So, the blue light calls to us and calls others here. So, let's see what the light has called from the shadows today. <clears throat> ah, it appears we have a dispatch from the future. Oh, it's a letter. All right, let's see. Hello, Jim. We're writing to you from the megacity of Ryu on Mars in the year 2478. Wow, it's amazing the postman got it here so quickly. We thought we'd send you the first true hand, uh, the true first-hand account of something that happened here just a few weeks ago. Hugs and kisses, your friends on Mars. Well, isn't that sweet? Well, it looks like we have our first story. So let's dig into it, shall we? This one's called How to Go to the Bank for Kids. Okay, but read the note. The lady at the counter just stared back blankly. Are you here for withdrawal, deposit, to set up an account, close an account, or other business? He slammed his fist on the counter. No, just read the note, damn it. I'm sorry, but world government policy requires you to state the nature of your visit to Garogara National Bank before any transaction may occur. Are you here for withdrawal, deposit, to set up an account, close an account, or other business? I hadn't wanted to go to the bank. I didn't want to go to the bank. I wanted to be at home, watching the hollow projector while surfing the internet on my data pad. The dog kept changing the channels, looking up at me with its little adorable eyes. No, I'm not falling for it. It cocked its head and barked. Okay, fine. Watch what you want and learn to talk back sometime. It barked again. Fine, but we're having Salisbury steak for dinner with rice and milk. It whined and shook its head. That was just a little too cute and mad scientist smart for its own good. Or, well, I probably just assume that. The dog changes the channels, and that is the mark of a man. Getting up, I went to the fridge and sorted through it. Salisbury steak? Check. Leftover rice? Check. Milk? Milk. Okay, darn it, we're out of milk. I just kind of stared at the fridge, and my lip curled into a sneer. Who used up the milk? I looked at my doggy, Jareth. At two, Jareth. It put its paws over its eyes. Hataru, I yelled. Do we have any more milk? She ran down the stairs, pushing her hair back behind her ear as she did so. As benefited the daughter of a vacuum company owner, she was impeccably cleanly. What's up, Kisan? She always said Kisan. I mean, geez, this is an honorable vacuum sales place where everybody's the most valuable customer. Being the customer is always right, I wanted to answer wittily. No, I didn't. We're out of milk. I like milk. Hataru's eyes got big, and I think I might have blown her ideas of what reality was. You drink milk, Kisa? If this were a pretentious French film, there would have been a montage of important landmarks and objects from her life breaking or bursting into flames reflected in her eyes. I mean, there wasn't. Just the kitchen counters and sparkling new government-sanctioned appliances, but I imagined it. Well, then... I didn't. 
but whatever. Anyway, so I was like, do you think I only drank coffee? And then she started apologizing for not having enough milk, as though it had been her personal and sacred duty to keep the fridge stocked with some milk in case I wanted something. I wish she was as chill as the fridge. Kisan, I will make this right right away. I just kind of stared, and the dog stared back at me, and everyone was staring. Then Hutaru's calm went off. She spoke into it a few times, glancing up at me, and her lush black hair falling in perfectly coordinated clumps in front of her eyes, and shut it off. Kisan, I am going on a date with a boy. She tilted in a weird way, like she had just asked a question. For a few seconds, I wondered if someone was playing a prank and it made me deaf and I'd missed the question. Or maybe I'd been kidnapped and this wasn't really Hataru. Or maybe we're in a computer simulation. Then I thought, screw it, I have no idea what she's talking about. So, Ki, I'm going to leave for that, the date, with another boy who isn't you. Jeez, I caught it the first time. I can take a hint. It's not a date with a girl. But if you wanted to go to the grocery store with me, you could ask me too. I thought about it. I could walk. It wasn't that far anyways. I didn't want to spoil her plans or whatever. No, I'm good, and I'll just walk over there. She looked hurt. I tried to figure out why as I walked over. That nothing seemed to jive right. What do you think, Jareth? Jareth just lowered his little doggy head. That's what I thought. No advice. I'll skip the walk over. There was some really hot sunlight, and there were a lot of people. It was awful. <sighs> I wish I could go for Hataru someday. I mean, I like her, but I'm not exactly qualified to be anybody's anything. At least not until I get some milk. <sighs> I grabbed the milk out of the eternal compression refrigerator and storage unit, Ekrasu for short, and walked over to the checkout. Or tried to. Sir, you can't bring your dog in here. Jareth was nobly following at my heels, and also, as I figured out, quickly lingering in front of vents so his fur shimmered as he walked. Show off. I'd like to buy this milk. The man shook his head. I'm sorry, sir, but there are no pets allowed in here. Oh, that, that's, that's okay. Jareth is family. I don't care what you call him, sir. No pets allowed. Don't we have, like, an alliance with some aliens or something? Do you like pissing them off? They're really tall. They'll put armbands on you and threaten you. He gave me a blank look. They put an armband on you, they threaten you, kill you, no. I suddenly realized nobody would get that reference. Not a people, a lot of people got out and saw aliens. I wasn't even sure why I brought it up. Look, sir, Marsh and I sit Lala welcomed as one of our own. Can I just buy the milk? It's against the policy of our public food dispensing service. I sighed. I really didn't want to do this. I could be at home, just not drinking milk, and being mildly liked and mostly useless. If you don't leave, I'm calling security. Oh, come on. He called security. My eye twitched. Fine. Fine. He wants to go? I'll go. We can do this. I pulled my sleeve up and began typing on the computer on my left arm. It only took me a few seconds to alter the protocol documents for running grocery dispersal buildings going back to the last five years to affirm that all dogs could be brought inside as long as they didn't pee on anything, and that employees obstructing dog owners should be held for interrogation and charged with treason. The security bots dragged him off, I scanned the milk, and put my credit stick into the machine. Then the words I had been dreading subconsciously came onto the screen. Account on hold. Please contact bank. Maybe I should have just hacked the bank, but the thing was, I was tired of doing stuff today, so I just walked over there. And that's how I got in line behind this guy. Just read the note already. I'm sorry, but you need to state your reason for being here, and as for withdrawal, deposit to set up an account, close an account, or other business. The man's eye twitched, and his mouth twitched. There was a lot of twitching. Okay, fine. This is a hold up. Yes, said the teller. You are holding up the line. He held up a gun. Oh, that kind of hold up. Yes, that kind of... Everybody get on the floor. The other two robbers pulled their high-end plasma rifles from their coats, and the one at the desk jumped over the counter and started pounding on the ceiling with bolts of energy, causing little bits of melted rebar to drop down into the crowd at the bank. This is a hold up. You're going to remain on the floor, or you will be shot. If you get up, you'll be shot. If you move, you will... Be shot. Now, remain where you are, and this will all end simply. I was wrong. There were actually two more robbers, bringing the total to five. I was wondering why the whole team of them hadn't been taken out by snipers when I saw that 
One nice young gent was going around placing what looked like triggered mines hastily attached to chains to make cheap necklaces around everyone's neck. I tried to be inconspicuous as I found the wireless signal they were using to remotely detonate them, and using my arm PC once again, disabled the mines. Close one. Then I called the cops. Now, the fact that I managed to do all that is really more up to the incompetence of the robbers than me being super awesome at hacking things. They were already walking through the crowd, grabbing headsets and computer pads, making sure that they totally showed those people who had already reported their numbers and placement to the cops that they were in charge, darn it. It was here that things went south. One of the robbers came from the back and said the hacker they had brought couldn't break the lock on the safe. I was busy counter-hacking them, having managed to break into the bank's closed internal systems through an outside email interface and inserting a few lines of code to establish a permalink to my ARM PC. You know, normal stuff. However, you can only rapidly tap your fingers on a glowing computer on your arm so much before even the dullest of minds realize that you are busy hacking their hacking attempts. Hey, you there. I tried to look like I didn't think he was talking to me, but he pistoled with me in the face. <laughs> Yeah, you. I'm talking to you. I had a dream once. A dream that guns had wireless interfaces and I could skip through fields of soldiers and only worry about getting knifed. I have to live with cold, hard reality, though, and all I could do was sever all their communication lines remotely so I could maybe get back in line and get my money so I could drink my milk. God, I shouldn't have let Hataru go on that date. I could have just always paid her back for the milk. Seriously. You're hacking us. I put on the straightest face I could. No, I'm not. Sounds honest to me, Lee. The man who was apparently named Lee looked over. I'm not. The name you said. I'm, I'm not the name you said. I'm Groundhawk. Groundhawk. Your name is Brazilian Elephant. My pistol whipping buddy looked confused. No, no, I'm Ken. Damn it, Ken. I mean, Brazil, they're code names, so the cops don't... <sighs> Get a... Get him over here. They dragged me over, literally, as I let my body go limp and closed my eyes. I was not going to be expending any more energy on this situation. My body stopped moving, and I opened my eyes to see Lee, who wouldn't be winning any beauty pageants anytime soon, lording over me with another gun. So, you're the hacker that's been causing us all the problems over the last ten minutes. Well, couldn't really argue with that, but I did! Nope. Uh, do you know what you're talking about? Look, stop messing around. We know you're Song Ki, the famous hacker. You were on the news. <sighs> Shh, hear that? That's the sound of my street cred dying. Uh, no, <laughs> that's, no, nah, that's me. <sighs> yep, nodded Lee. Open the bank vault. Right away, sir. I was working on opening the door when I asked the robber guarding me a question. Can you draw me an Ouroboros? Ouroboros? Yeah, you know, it it never ends. Like a circle. No, it's like a snake that eats itself. The front end goes into the back end and it never stops. I don't believe in that. Look, I'm not not asking that. I need to draw one to look at it so I can lay in the non-decimal coding. He paused. I think that goes against my religion? What religion would possibly not like that? Whatever my wife's is. Well, Saint Bowie loves all that is Ouroboros, after all. He titled the work the width of a circle. I thought you said it wasn't a circle. In the name of Space Pope John Paul the 18th, are you going to draw that or not? No. I looked at the lock and made sure I had messed with enough that the bank itself was going to have a pain opening it. Well, then I can't help you anymore. Lee, he's not cooperating. Lee looked over. We'll throw him in the janitor's closet. The non-snake-eating man picked me up and carried me over to the janitor's closet, which smelled of cheap cleaning chemicals. I heard the non-electric door click. Now, sitting alone in that room, I thought I would finally be free to sleep, just relax and wait for this whole thing to blow over, but that isn't what happened. Something I wasn't expecting happened. I was angry. Really, really angry. I wanted my milk, damn it. Hataru was out on a date. Oh, oh, and that whole thing had been her trying to invite me to go with her to the grocery store instead of going with him. 
great, I'm an idiot, they're idiots, everybody's an idiot, and there was only one thing to do when that happens. You have to, like my dog, go mad scientist on them. I looked around, my eyes got keen, and I was all of a sudden my own man. There were broken robots, a few porter bots, a dusted diplomacy bot, a cleaning bot. Perfect. I had my plan. I ripped the arms and legs off the porter bots. I needed six or maybe eight. I'll decide why I worked. I need the arm from the diplomacy bot. I need to modify it a little. Aha! Take the cleaning fluid injector from the cleaning robot. Perfect. As I stood in front of my creation, I felt real pride for the first time in years. When it bashed the closet door down and slithered down, squealing its fierce robotic war cry, the robbers were not expecting what they had earned. Go, my robot snake friend. No, don't bite your own tail. Yes, good. Free the bank from hooligans. Allow me to buy milk. Bite all who stand in the way of calcium-rich nutrition. I heard one say he didn't really believe that before he was injected with toxic cleaning solution by a snake bite. The mechanical creature squealed and leaped ten feet in the air as it tackled Lee and broke his arms and probably a few limbs. It bit the next robber and chased the other two down, grabbing them both within its unholy snake hug grip and nipping them. As I stepped toward the main hall of the bank, the freed populace looked up at me and cried in joy. The cops gave me a medal, and I had to smile and take a lot of pictures. When it was all over, I sat back down at home and turned the hollow projector on. So, how was your day? asked Tataru. I shrugged and took a sip of milk straight from the carton. Eh, it was all right. Hataru nodded. Why is there a robot snake in the foyer? The dog changed the channel. I shrugged. And it turned out I was wrong about Lee. He won the best looking life says in prisoner that fall. Thank you. And now, a word from our sponsors, vampires. Have you drunk enough water today? Are you exercising enough? Eating right? Hi, we're the American Association of Vampires, and we'd like you to take better care of yourself, because right now, you guys taste terrible. Imagine if you were ready to bite into a nice juicy steak, but then you tasted it and found out the cow had only lived on Cheetos or Mountain Dew. When we've had a long day of hiding from the vicious, evil sun, we're just like you. We want to sit back, turn on some Netflix, and take a bite into the neck of a victim we brought off the street. But we can't do that unless you're living your best life. So take care of your blood. Your neighborhood vampire will appreciate it. Paid for by the American Association of Vampires who want to eat people. Yes. <laughs> we occasionally have. Tickets. So are you gonna you're gonna uh, get set for the next segment? How about if I do a little business? Y go for it. Excellent. Hey everybody. Yeah. Uh, so this is not live at the Blue Box, so I don't need to get booed. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Those of you that know live at the Blue Box, as you can tell, this is a very different format. This is our new show that we are producing, co-producing with the Blue Box, called Tales by the Blue Light, which we couldn't talk about until the Blue Light actually made it to that side of the room. Um, so uh, we don't have any social media set up for it yet, but if you want to know about what's happening with this, you can follow Jim at ArcBeetle on Twitter, or you can follow at SMG Pods, or find on uh, Facebook, we have a Facebook page called Live at the Blue Box, and we're, I think we're going to keep it that way for now. We're not going to add a second one yet. Or did we get one? We have one, and we've done nothing with it. Ooh. As soon as we move the blue light next to it, then we'll actually start it. Yeah, so here's the deal. Second Saturday of every month is the regular live at the Blue Box. They are now themed. The one coming up February, second Saturday, is video games. And we've got people that want to be guests, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the last one we did was Sherlock. We just did Star Wars. We did Harry Potter. Every one of them has been a blast for us uh, and for the audience, believe it or not. Uh, and then uh, the third Saturday of every month, Tales by, for, by the Blue Light. Tales by the Blue Light. And then the fourth Saturday, we have another new show. It's not us, but it is a blue box joint. And uh, oh. yeah, so the fourth Saturday of every month, we're doing it. For us. I, I'm, I'm commandeering the mic. It's my place. It's okay. Um, it's going to be called Disgruntled Baristas. And actually, Joey, who is back there now, and Lena are going to do. It's going to be a theme each month. 
This month, which is next week, is Edgar Allan Poe. So they're going to do things in the style of Poe. Here you go. I got it. You got mine? Yeah. Sorry. Um, it's so it's going to be the style of Poe. There's going to be a writing contest yeah, where you can do a five-minute little uh, essay. Um, there will be prizes. They're going to do things in the style, like I said, the style of Poe. They're going to be reading from The Raven and The Pit and the Pendulum. So if you're into that, plus cosplay. So if you like Victorian, you like Edgar Allan Poe, please come next week. And then we'll have more on that on social media as well. Sorry. Did you do first well, mic too? Did you do open mic? And so the first Friday no, is I open didn't. is going to be open mic or other events if we have it. So the first fr the first Saturday of every month will be open mic. That'll be what February third is that the date? I'm sorry, I don't even know the date off the top of my head, but we'll say February third. I get it all wrong anyway. Third, uh, is third is on a Friday. So it'd be the fourth. <laughs> Quick math. By Quick Chris math. Miles. Yes. Uh, all right. So we've got another segment here? Yeah. I get to guest star on one. Uh, one more thing, last tiny bit of business, and I may say this a couple times tonight. This is something else that's different. Normally we talk about our box here that says uh, donations for Southgate Media Group. This is Jim's show. So if you want to support Jim, he drives in from Indiana. That way he gets a little gas money, uh, pays for paper. <laughs> we have a donation box. So if you feel so inclined, please support Jim. It all goes 100% to him. Ready? All right. Oh, and I got food. I won't food. I promise. I, it's not like a normal live at the blue box. I'm not going <laughs> to eat during it. Okay. We ready? All right. I'm person? Yeah, you're person. Hey, Jim. So what? This show is going to have sci-fi stories then? Well, yeah, every month, like Clockwork Robots. Oh, awesome. Look, can I pitch one to you? Sure. I mean, we're on the air, but, you know, go for it. Okay. So there are three ducks. Okay. Okay, so I haven't thought it out further than that. So I was hoping you could help me figure out the rest of the story. The rest of the story beyond there being three ducks. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're a writer, right? Right, I write. Okay. Do you write right? I hope so. So come on, finish this three duck story for me. You know, sci-fi isn't the only kind of story we're going to have here. We're still bringing all the parts of specular fiction here. Sci-fi, fantasy, heck, even horror. Even horror. Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of that too. I just said it. You're going to tell a horror story about my precious ducks. Y you know what? I'll leave the ducks out this time. Okay, that sounds good to me. So what's next? All right, this is a little low story I like to call the end of the hallway. Now, part of your job here is to not ask what your job is here. It's a simple job. You come in every morning at 5 a.m. You come in through the reception area and slide your key card at the fourth door on the left. There you will find a room with one other door and a single table with a silver tray on it. Some of the days, the tray will have something on it. Other days, it will not. You will pick up the tray, regardless of if it is empty, and you will open the other door and carry it down to the end of the hallway you find there, where you will set it on a table at the other end of the hallway before turning around and walking out, shutting both doors behind you. Is that clear? Victoria nodded. It was clear enough, not that it made a lot of sense, but beggars couldn't be choosers, and she needed this job. Her hand was clenched tightly, digging her fingernails into her palm. If it hurt enough, she wouldn't say anything stupid this time. The image of her boss's horrified face as she tore into him broke into her mind again, and she dug her nails deeper. The contract you sign will employ you for a minimum of one month with our firm. You cannot leave the position until then. Well, that wasn't a problem. You'll start tomorrow. Your payment will be deposited in your account at the end of each day. Each day? Victoria replied, her surprise opening her mouth. Is that a problem? The woman asked. She shook her head, pushing out the questions of why. It wasn't every two weeks or month. It didn't matter. It was a job. It didn't matter that she didn't understand what she was doing or why she was doing it. It didn't matter. It sounded like some sort of drug thing. She just knew. She had a job. Finally. Victoria showed up to work early, but found the door wouldn't open when she slid her key card. She waited outside, shivering in the still cold that hadn't seemed so biting when her muscles had been moving. She slid the card again. Nothing. When 5 a.m. hit, she slid it again and the door popped open. 
The room beyond it was brightly lit, painted white, and featured no notable features other than a plain black table with a silver tray containing a small brown cardboard box and a blank door with a handle on it. Following her instructions, she lifted the tray and opened the door into a totally dark hallway. She pushed the door all the way open and felt it push back against her hand. If she walked in, it would close behind her, leaving her in total darkness. She stepped away from it and tried to move the table. No luck, it was bolted to the floor. The door clicked shut as she pulled on it. Victoria tried the other door and found it wouldn't move. It didn't even have a handle on it, let alone a card reader on this side. She pressed her hands against the door and pushed. Nothing. Her heart raced. Was she trapped in here? Was she going to die in the small white room filled with nothing but her quickening breath? She closed her eyes and paced her breathing. She was being paranoid. She had a job to do, and she would do it. She knew the job was sketchy. They just didn't want her to take whatever was in the box. Deep breaths in, slow breaths out. Deep breaths in, slow breaths out. She backed away from the door and picked up the tray again. The box held a brisk weight. She opened the second door into darkness and stepped inside. There was no light at all. It was the kind of pitch black you don't see in a world where everything you own has a glowing light on it. She could fight this old darkness, the shadow from the past where you delve so deep into a cave no one could find you even if they were a foot away. She pulled out her cell phone and used the flashlight feature. It glowed as bright as she could get it and she saw the nature of the room, partly. To her right was a wall that stretched on far beyond what she could see. To her left, the floor continued until the light ran out. She couldn't see the wall on the other side, though. Of course it had to be there. She stayed by the wall to her right, balancing her phone on the tray against the box like a headlight. The hallway went on and on. Her elbow brushed reassuringly against the wall, reminding her she had a connection to the world, and she wasn't simply lost in this place. She half expected to stumble and fall on some foreign object on the room's floor, but it was smooth and clean. She walked on and on, and the light on her phone went off. She balanced the tray against the wall and tried to turn it on, but the battery had died. Had she really been walking that long? She wanted to stop, to curl up against the wall. But she pressed on. She needed to get out of here, get over her fear, and walk. Then the light came on. It was a slender beam, illuminating another black table exactly like the one in the room she'd started in. Finally, she walked up to it and set the tray down. The light switched off, and as she let out a relieved breath, she felt a hand, cold and clammy, slide around her wrist from the other side of the table. You're new, a voice said. She bolted, running headlong into the darkness, her body adrift in it, the space it occupied meaningless aside from the place the sole of her shoe impacted the tiled floor. She had no idea where she was going or where she was. The wall was on the right when you came in, so in reverse, it's on your left. Of course, of course. She ran left and bumped into the wall hard, making her let out a loud wince. <sighs> But she didn't stop. She didn't stop until she was running out the first door into the white room and then straight out the second door, which popped open as soon as the first one had clicked shut. She ran down the road and didn't stop till her lungs gave out on her, and she slumped against the side of a building, staring up at the sunlight. <sighs> I'm, I'm sorry, Victoria. We went over this the last 12 times you called. You can't have your old job back. Look, I know I messed up. I did. But I, I can't go back to the job I just got. You don't understand. Oh, no. I do understand. You thought you were untouchable, that you could just say or do anything you wanted. And now where are you? Where are you working? Sanitation? Fast food? I know for sure the boss called every firm in the city telling them not to hire you. Even the competition wouldn't want to touch you after what you pulled. I'm sorry, Victoria whispered. You know damn well that's not good enough, Vic. The call ended, and Victoria rested her forehead on the fridge. The memory of the clammy hand crept up her wrist. She didn't want to go back tomorrow, but she didn't have any other choice. She had already been living above her means when she was fired. She didn't even have the money for a bus ticket out of town. 
Trying to calm herself, she slid under the covers of her bed, hoping to sleep, when her phone dinged, notifying her of a new message. Hello, this is a friendly notification that your direct deposit has gone through. You now have $1,057 in your account. She had had $57 in her account before. $1,000 a day? That was more than the contract said. More by a long shot. She stared at the message till she knew no matter her fears, she'd be going back tomorrow. At 5 a.m. sharp, Victoria arrived at the door with two flashlights, one battery-powered, one that you could shake to recharge, a bunch of snacks, a door jam, and a knife in the messenger bag. She entered into the door and found that the tray was empty. With nothing to balance on it, she picked it up and stuck it under her arm, taking out the rechargeable flashlight and turning it on before opening the door, jamming it open with the door jam and stepping inside. Scanning the room with the flashlight, she could see the wall to the left. It didn't seem so far away now. The room was wider than the white entry room, sure. But before, the wall had seemed unfathomable. Now it just seemed like an awkward architectural design. Huh. Starting her walk, she found the hallway more empty than she'd imagined it. The feature she hadn't noticed was a very slight slope to the room. She was walking downwards, so slowly she might never have noticed it if it hadn't been for the angled cut of the stones making up the wall's base on either side of her. She sunk down at least a story, maybe two, by the time she reached the light shining on the black table. She pointed her flashlight on it, and something scampered into the safety of the shadows. She followed it with the flashlight. Wait. Don't. She angled the light towards the floor in front of her. Why not? It's not part of your job, is it? She could feel it grinning as it spoke. They never said it wasn't. They never said someone was in here. That's because you're not supposed to ask questions. That's what they told you. They tell all the couriers that. You put the tray down and you leave. And you grab the wrists? There was silence. You smelled different. They didn't tell me the last one was leaving. I wanted to be sure. You could have looked. There was the sound of bare feet pattering on the tiled floor. Set the tray down and leave. Leave! She did, listening closely to see if whoever it was was behind her. The next day, she came back again. And this time, there was a long cardboard box in the tray. She set it down. The light above the table went off, and she walked back out. The day after that, another box, this one big enough to hold a basketball. More boxes, day after day, and Victoria began to enjoy her job as much as she could. She listened to podcasts and audiobooks walking down the dark hallway, and the absence of light suddenly gave her imagination a whole new level as she walked. She was transported in her mind to different worlds, and when she left the building, it wasn't even lunchtime. Victoria had plenty of money now, too, and after a month, she'd long forgotten that a month was the minimum time she'd signed on for. After two months, she began to see what happened to her other job as a blessing. What exactly do you do as a job now, anyways? Her friend Jennifer asked her, looking up and down at Victoria's new outfit. Victoria laughed, swirling the drink she'd ordered with the fancy name. I carry a tray with a box, well, sometimes without a box, from one table to another building. I've got to say it's the best job I've ever had. You're serious? Of course I'm serious. This isn't another of your wild stories? Victoria's smile collapsed. You had to bring that up, didn't you? What, we were having too much fun? No, no, it's just... That isn't something people pay other people to do. At least not, you know, if it's anything reputable. Of course it's reputable. Who do you think I am? I wouldn't work for the mafia or something. Jennifer stared her down. How can you be 100% sure you aren't working for the mafia? Victoria was silent. What's the company you work for called? Um, it's, it's called C. 234 LLC. And that isn't sketchy to you? Victoria stared into her drink. 
The swirl of orange peel on the side seemed much less festive than when she'd ordered it. She almost wished it would turn into the face of her former boss, like she was in a Dickens novel. But no such luck. Instead, she became aware of how soon that piece of orange peel would dry up and become worthless. She downed her drink. Not sketchy to me at all. Now, now tell me, how are things going around my old office, huh? Jennifer sighed. She always asked that, and she always wanted to know too much. Another month in, Victoria set the empty tray down, and a voice shifted out of the darkness. Wait. She'd almost forgotten it was there, whoever it was. She stopped. Don't leave yet. I want to talk to someone. I need to. She took a step back. About what? About you and about me. Maybe I'll last longer. A slender hand reached out and felt the tray. Then there was annoyed vocalization. Ah, nothing today, nothing again. I thought I wasn't supposed to ask questions. You're not, but what's a little fun between friends? You're here every day in my room. I get curious. Victoria molded over. Okay, I suppose if I'm going to be working here a while, why not? Don't be shy, Victoria. All right. What's in the boxes? The voice chuckled. <laughs> what I eat. So food. What I eat. What do you eat? It's what I eat. Victoria sighed. All right, then. Do you live here? I have been in my room as long as I know. I have been told the outside is filled with light, but I've only seen small lights. You and the others bring light with you, and there is the light on the table and the light of the furnace. Though that light is different, it's warm. Victoria couldn't see any light behind them. Where's the furnace? It's behind us. You cannot see it now. It only lights up in the evening, and only then for a short while, when I burn the box and carry the tray to the door, where the first courier will remove it to set the box he brings in the morning. This is the order of the world. Then she realized it. You said my name was Victoria. I never told you that. <laughs> it laughed. <laughs> Why do you think I am here? She shrugged, not that it saw. I don't know. I thought the boxes might have drugs in them and you cut them for purity. No, 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 not that. What do you do when you want to hide something? Well, that's a silly question. You hide it. You shove it in a drawer. You're hiding plenty. You say too much and think too little, but I see you all the same. You come here every day with a box. You never look in the box. You never question it, but you're willing to question so many things. Say so many things. Hurt so many things. You've grown accustomed to the darkness like me. Tell me. What did he say when you put that file on his hard drive? Your boss. Victoria backed away. How did you know about that? I know a lot of things about you. It's why I'm here. It's why you're here. Tell me, did you think it was funny putting that on his hard drive? Did you expect him to go red in the face? For him to be excited? <laughs> Too bad for you. Who could tell who uploaded the file, wasn't it? I need to leave, Victoria said, her pace quickening. The slow slap of feet on tile came towards her. Yet you kept talking. You told the press, even after it was confirmed, it was you. It didn't matter what the facts were. They had their stories, and they ripped him to shreds. Not literally, sadly. The footfall sounded as cold and damp as the hand had. Victoria wondered if she should run. You ruined him and his family. Whatever a family is, mind you, I only know things, not understand them. But I know you're here for a special reason. Tell me, how would you hide a body? This isn't funny anymore. Maybe you'd hire someone, someone with connections. They wouldn't dump it anywhere. They'd box it up one part at a time and ship it to a place it could be disposed of slowly. No questions. A cautious system. You said the packages were what you eat. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, they are. Delicious, aren't they? But one more question. What if you wanted a person to disappear? Not just the body. They'd wronged you, and they wanted you gone. But with no funny questions. Why? They'd send you to a place where you could make a new life, give you riches, 
give you something to brag about, make others ask questions about it. You don't want to. Then in a few months, you're no longer the woman who was laid off. You're the woman with a sketchy job, the woman who got into something she shouldn't have. No one will be surprised or suspect you paid for you to be here. And I promise you, I won't leave a trace. She ran. She ran hard. The footsteps followed her. And when she reached the door, she found the door jam on the floor, the handle not turning. She spun around, drawing her knife and scanning her flashlight. I can wait, the voice said. I've got all the time in the world. She shook the flashlight. Hours passed. She ate all of her snacks. She resisted the urge to use the bathroom. She waited. She tried not to fall asleep, but she was so tired. She shook the flashlight. Maybe just a few minutes. It wouldn't notice. She shook the flashlight gently. Just a few minutes. Jack looked over the contract. You're saying all I have to do is carry a box down a hallway? <laughs> she shined me up. I was beginning to think I'd never get another job. The woman smiled at him, holding out the pen for him to sign the month-long contract. Oh, I'm sure you'll be a delectable addition to our team. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, this is our first interview segment we've had here, so this is... Rich Perez. Hello, everyone. Am I talking right through this thing? I always have challenges with these microphones. <laughs> yes, yes, they're difficult to master at first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Especially for this inaugural event. So. Yeah, okay. So, could you start off by just telling everybody what you basically do? What are you known for writing? Well, um, I've been writing <laughs> essentially uh, science fiction, horror, short stories for... I don't know, I want to say about about 35 years now, so i um, been doing it as a, you know, kind of a sidebar passion, turned it into a line of business maybe about seven, eight years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, well, long and short of it is we became a publishing company for comic books, so we're an independent co comic publisher based out of Elgin. So, yeah, so, <laughs> but yeah, the short stories deal with, you know, Fantasy, sci-fi, horror, anything that, you know, kind of been scares me, these kind of things, stuff like that. Any place I want to go, these are the, the influences, if you will, of my imagination to take me and try and get some revenue in terms of comic book publishing. So, Yeah, so the project you just finished up recently is Infinium, right? That's correct, yeah. So we just finished up our last and final issue. Um, goodness, that took about... 18 months to complete, and mind you, 18 months for a comic book, essentially about 20 minutes of reading. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot of effort for a little bit of material, you know what I mean? So there's, we're doing it out of love, as you can tell, so that's part of the fun. But yeah, um, finally got to be able to finish that off. It was a double size issue. We released it uh, late last year, and very, very happy, relieved. Etc. To, to wrap that up and you know tie a knot in that one. So it was our little swan song to uh, our love letter to the Silver Age of comics. Uh, we were able to tell that story. I'm very very relieved. So are the, were the Silver Age of comics then something that really inspired you in terms of how those comics were you know written back in the day? Oh, absolutely. So um, I used to steal comics from my brother and my cousins and so on. And all these comics were you know essentially materials from the 60s and 70s. So that's what I grew up on, um, and anything older than that was kind of really, really hard to find. Yeah. But in any event, that's what I grew up with. This is what kind of was ingrained in my head in terms of the, you know, what I read, what I enjoyed, and, you know, a lot of the, the fantastic stories that came out, you know, from the 60s, 70s, and even the 80s for that matter, I should say. And even even post, you know, postmodern materials as well. Yeah, and what about those stories um, have you tried to emulate since then? Oh, good. Uh, so, you know, Stan Lee, of course, uh, Roy Thomas, um, Jim Starlin. These are the, you know, uh, Chris Claremont. These are mm -hmm. the science fiction writers, the fantasy writers who really kind of inspired me, you know, from a comic book perspective. But, you know, from a sci-fi arena, you know, it's Isaac Asimov. Uh, there's countless other writers as well, um, H.G. Wells, of course, you know. But, again, all that combined is really kind of what shapes and models, you know, 
the, the clay in my head in terms of coming up with stories. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, uh, okay, so you've also worked on a few other things. You've got Infinium, which is superheroes. Correct. Um, you've got Max Temple, which is paranormal detectives. Correct, yeah. And so you also have Descent of the Dead. Descent of the Dead is our science fiction horror comic uh, almost done. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be wrapping it up this year. Um, think of it like a combination of, like, uh, G.I. Joe meets, you know, the, the living dead. And, uh, and they have to, you know, essentially fight and deal with them and exterminate them, if at all possible. So it's a kind of a post... Uh, Apocalyptic story takes place in the future, very James Bondish in a lot of way, a lot of gizmos and stuff like that. But there's teams and people who are specially trained to eliminate and destroy the undead. And uh, they're also pre-infected, so it's hard for them to get turned and stuff like that. So they're special crack squad that have been thrown out there. Uh, nobody likes them, but they're good at what they do. So it sounds kind of like that story is a bit of a genre mashup in some ways. Or, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, it's a hybrid between Romero and, you know, some of the, you know, 60s, 70s, you know, uh, Green Beret type stories you get from John Wayne and so on, along with, you know, the postmodern G.I. Joe stories, you know, from the uh, 80s and even the 90s for that matter. So it was kind of a mashup between that, you know, to come up with that story. Yeah, um, so when trying to, like, mash those sort of things up together, mm -hmm. what... Um do you have any kind of goal you're trying to lead towards with the reader in getting these things to jive with each other? What you're trying to bring out? Yeah, well, we're at all possible. You know, you try and come up with something original, and yeah. that is a challenge in itself. So where you can't be original, at least, you know, pay homage <laughs> to the right materials mm -hmm. and you know, throw a few hooks in there at the same time. Um, so you know, in that sense, you know, fundamentally, when I do a horror story, I want to I want to creep you out. Yeah. You know, I want to I want to scare you, and you know, scaring you is a challenge in itself because usually how I scare you the first time, I can't do it the second time, right? So it's a little bit of a trick there. So I have to kind of sit there. It's like, okay, well, if we did it this way, now we got to come up with something new. Um, that's a challenge, and that's an interesting challenge because I got to sit there and try it each and every way. I can only say boo to you once, and, yeah, yeah. and it won't work the second time. But yeah, coming up with those ideas, uh, and again, you know, you've got your, you know, subtle gore, you've got your violence, you've got, uh, but at the same time, you've got suspense, and I think suspense and you know, psychological terror is probably the more scary elements because again, once yeah. the cat's out of the bag, it's not scary anymore, you know. Yeah, you know, I've always thought horror is one of the harder elements to write in a story because with something like comedy, if you show it to someone, you can very easily tell from their reactions right. if it's working. And horror, you really don't know until you've built up to a point with it. That's true, yeah. And plus, you know, what scares me might not necessarily scare you mm -hmm. or, you know, vice versa. So there's that challenge, too. Um, so, again, I think keeping mm -hmm. to the element of suspense and, you know, action suspense is really where, you know, you kind of drive that. But, again, you know, fear is the unknown. And keeping things unknown and interesting is way, you know, you to bottle up fear in, a, you know, in the bottle there. But um, again, that's, you know, there lies the challenge, you know, in kind of keeping that hamster wheel going in terms of interest and engagement when writing these types of stories. So I don't do a lot of horror, and that's part of the reason why, <laughs> um, because it really takes a lot of formulation to do that. Um, comedy, I'm not pitting one against the other. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, you can get people's ideas, you can come up with experiences, and you can come up with some wit. And again, you can kind of size up what's going on there in terms of how to deliver, you know, an experience that will, you know, make people smile and laugh and so on. But yeah, yeah that's... <laughs> yeah, which isn't knocking comedy. Comedy's hard to write. It's just easy to tell the reaction for. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And with fear, well, you won't know until well afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so it takes a little time to kind of generate. Sometimes you can get people to get startled, but after a while, it's got to play in your mind for a little bit. It's like, oh, yeah. well, yeah, that was pretty messed up. Can you give an example of something either that you've seen that really influenced you or something you've written that you felt really worked where you got that mesh in horror to work right? So, I'll, yeah, I think one of my bigger influences when it came to horror was probably Stephen King. King actually had an element of delivering suspense and fear with 
not so much actually. He had a lot of visual, you know, visual acuity where he made things very relatable to you. So I'll use, for example, like the story of It. Um, he used, you know, universal monsters in his story. And, you know, one way or another, there's, if you love those characters, there's usually one or several that really, really scared you. So for me, for example, it was Frankenstein. And when he actually made reference to Frankenstein in that story, and he came out of the, uh, out of the marsh walking towards these kids, that was horrifying for me. That was something that was really, really relatable. And watching them come out of there, you know, and this menace that really was out to harm these children was genuinely terrifying for me. So um, I borrow upon that, you know, in terms of some of my story. Not too much, of course, but there's a literary sense within King that I actually really, really enjoy his level of description. Uh, you know, I, I beg, borrow, steal wherever possible. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, great artists steal, good artists borrow, as the old adage yeah. goes. Um, so going back a bit, your previous work there that we t just skipped over a little bit, Max Temple, Paranormal Detective. So, from mm. the name of that, Paranormal Detective, it seems like it has some of the same ideas. How's, what's that work like? So, Max Temple mm -hmm. um, is a detective service based out of Chicago. It's a comic that we're coming out with this year, and it deals with kind of a, uh, kind of a sad sack detective who actually has a very intuitive partner who is um, a psychic. And the way it works is that he's a, actually a well-experienced police detective, and she happens to be a very well-experienced psychic. He leverages those skills to help them solve murders. And essentially, if they can pinpoint the body within, I think it's 48 hours of the time of death, um, he, she's able to speak to the spirit and find out exactly what happened. If not, the spirit descends or ascends, you know, depending on their sense of direction. And then at which point, you know, they're there's no way they can essentially be in contact with that and solve the, solve the mystery. So it's a race against time. Yeah. And at the same time, well, they have to go find a body in order to find out what happened because most of the times in, in, those, in those situations, the body's missing. Otherwise, easy to solve. Yeah. So one thing I'm hearing a lot of with you know, what you've written and the kind of things you like creating, which is something I like doing myself as a writer, is what we talked about a little bit ago, you know, playing around with merging different genres together mm -hmm. and merging different feelings. Because um, the whole idea of taking those kind of paranormal, supernatural elements, merging them with a detective like that, uh, you know, you can think of a few other examples of it in fiction, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's still a very open concept with a lot to do with it. Um, but also, whenever you take that, it is difficult to get the elements balanced right sometimes. Do you ever feel like that? Yeah, it definitely is. Um, again, because you don't, when you're dealing with that kind of genre, you don't want to, you don't want to reveal too much. You got to keep some element of mystery contained. Uh, so sometimes there's an urgency oftentimes, especially with modern writers, to over explain things. Yeah. Um, so the challenge with that is, again, the cat's out of the bag. Um, you take, you know, people who do, you know, modern movies, and I'm going to kind of, you know, diverge slightly oh, here. Go, you know, delve into you it. You got people like John yeah. Carpenter. He had made some very scary movies, mm -hmm. and you don't know anything about the adversaries at the end of the day. You just know that they were there, they were menacing, mm -hmm. they killed, but you never got an explanation as to why. You know, you don't know what made them, and that was part of the fear factor, so... Um, even non-horror movies. He did a movie called Assault on Precinct 13. I don't know if anybody's seen that or not, but people just came out of the blue and assaulted this police precinct, and you don't know why. And they recede, and they barely survive, and that's the end of the story. And they're like, well, what was the motivation behind it? You don't know. All you know is that that, that moment in time, they were attacked, and they were fighting for their lives, and then it just ended. Yeah. And yeah. I think... You know, that, there's, a, there's a dose of reality with that because, again, sometimes we're just not given the luxury of an explanation mm -hmm. in life. We just got to keep rolling on. And I think, like I said, there's, there's an eeriness to that um, that's kind of lost, and I'm hoping that we can kind of bring that back. So it's like, okay, I'm going to reveal a little bit, but not too much, if you kind of follow what I'm saying. Yeah, so. yeah, I follow what you're saying, definitely. Um, and so that's something you're trying to bring in your own stories, then that sense of the unknown, of having elements that feel real but that feel 
like there's stuff you really don't know about them. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's, again, you're going to have to, you'll have to work on faith sometimes. Yeah. So it's like, oh, well, how does that work? Well, it's magic. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or it's supernatural. And you just have to leave it at that sometimes. And sometimes it's just evil. Mm-hmm. You know, and those are the things that drive the, you know, drive the story. And you got to keep that element of mystery going too. Because again, if I explain too much to you, it's like, oh, well, now I know. I don't need to read it anymore. You know what I mean? And that it takes, you know, it takes the element of mystery out of it too. So I, you got to keep people motivated. You know, keep things, some things hidden, but again, subtle reveals with time. Yeah, yeah. So in general, then you'd say, like, if you were given a story, someone mm-hmm. else's story, and you were told to edit it, they okay. explained everything about what was going on, you'd want to cut it down, leave things into the imagination. Absolutely, yeah. Again, you know, there, I guess it, it depends on what, you know, people are, what, they, what mm-hmm. the motivation in the story itself is. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, just the level of detail they want, sometimes it's good to, you know, to kind of take a, a bit of a stand off of it and uh, be a little more ambiguous. Because again, it keeps people engaged. Like, why? What? You know, it gets them asking the question. So, that's really what you want to do. And you know, oftentimes when you're doing those kind of, you know, you know, those kind of suspense stories, you want to keep people, keep them guessing. Otherwise, again, you know, it kind of takes the fun out of it. You want them to be the detectives too, try to figure things out along the way. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got then. Um, do you find writing Infinium superheroes very different from writing your? more horror-oriented stories, or do you find a lot of perils in how you write them? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a different pacing to it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, when I wrote The Infinium, it was kind of a, you know, a gradual ride up to the roller coaster. Um, and, you know, you're watching the, the evolution of a person, you know, become something more than themselves. Um, so that takes time, and that's a little bit of a slower burn. Mm-hmm. Um, but with horror, you kind of like Jaws, you got to get right into it. You've got to get the fear factor established, and you got to throw people into the muck early, and then you take them for the ride from there. So it's a, it's a much quicker launch in that sense. You got to get them, you know, in, engaged a little bit faster because again, it's a different, it's a different theme. Uh, and then at which point, you know, the, the RPM levels will vary. So the, the horror has to slow down. You have to sprinkle some elements of humor, some suspense, some mystery. You got to slow that down and dial down the RPMs. Mm-hmm. And then with, you know, your Superhero stories, you got to ramp it up. You got to you know, put in the afterburners, and you got to get that action going too, because otherwise you're going to lose your audience. So that's kind of that. There's a like I said, it's almost like a polarized balance between the two from an RPM level when you write these kind of stories. At least that's how you know. That's how I had to do it. All right. So from all the things we've talked about, I now have one question. I'm very curious about your opinion on in writing, which is twists. So twists. You, yeah. So I love you, them. you have something you you know you think. You know, you've kept information from the audience. It's a mystery. And then right at the end, you throw something in there that changes how they assumed things were going. Yeah. I mean, again, if it really drives a story, helps drive the character, throw in those twists. Um, but, you know, make sure it's meaningful. It has a purpose. It drives and furthers, you know, either the mm-hmm. plot, the story, the character, so on. Otherwise, if it's, you know, for, you know, just... You know, for a cheap thrill, I'm kind of against it. So it really, like I said, I, I, I'm all for yeah, it. Yeah. I love a good twist. And, you know, it makes you head, you know, scratch your head. It's like, oh, I didn't see that coming. Mm-hmm. Oh, now I know why this happened. You know what I mean? And again, yeah, it yeah. just expands on the lore, you know, of the character or the, you know, of the world that you're writing with. So, yeah, yeah I'm all for it. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, um, thank you for talking to us. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, yeah, thank I'm you, James. Yeah, it's good to meet you, and I'm ex- interested in checking out some of your stuff now, especially uh, Descent of the Dead sounded pretty fascinating. So, all right. All right. Thank you for all being right. our first guest. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Did you promote where you can get Rich's stuff? First oh, of all, oh, well, I'm first so, of all, I'm a Rich amateur. and Tango oh. Comics are at the different Comic Cons. That's how I know Rich. That's uh, right, yeah. Uh, aside from him being my arch enemy when we play games. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, but it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> we, but, uh, but you can find them. If you go to like the library cons, we're big fans of the library cons. They're always at the Elgin one. Uh, you library, can meet yeah, all the guys from Tango Comics, even Rage, unfortunately. Uh, you can... <laughs> and you can uh, right. You get set, everything signed, and the books are great. Where can they follow you? Where can they find you? So, Facebook, Twitter... Uh, all one word, Tango Comics. 
And our website is tangocomics.com. There you go. That was All easy. Right. Uh, yeah, go. his stuff's awesome. And we were supposed to have, we had these great digital things, and Chris couldn't get it working. So his fault. So sorry, Rich. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. You know what? <laughs> yeah, we'll just put them up next week randomly. We're going to do a microcon here. We'll let you know the date. We'll have you guys out. We'll make sure we promote it that way. Sounds so, like a plan. Right. One more time, let's hear it for Rich. All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Broadcasting live from his abandoned missile silo in an unmarked location in Utah, it's Terrence Youngworth with Monster Hunter Weekly. What's that? Sorry, I've just been handed a correction. We regret to inform our audience that the usual host of Monster Hunter Weekly has been killed in yet another freak accident or freak werewolf attack. Should have pre-read. We're not sure exactly what we're going to do here. Uh, oh, I've just received word that a replacement is on its way and should be there any moment. Uh, hello? Can you hear me? Mm, this is uh, at the blue light? Um, is this the microphone? It's covered in... Oh, uh, okay. Well, let's not worry about what that is specifically. Uh, where's the old host, though? Um, someone left something under the table. Just to say, oh, well, I found the old host. Well, rest in peace or whatever. Oh, it's on. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry about the abrupt start here. I thought I'd have time to clean up first. You can. I'll be fine. <laughs> so hello, everyone at the Blue Light. My name is Magpie Jones, and I'm your new host of Monster Hunter Weekly, your source for news hunting dangerous critters all over the United States. I'll be working from this pile of notes I just found right in front of me this week. Uh, so let's check in here. Hmm. Oh, all right. Well, it looks like we have an update from our gang of werewolf hunters in Cleveland. All right, Cleveland. All right, Shantae says, send help. Please send help. They found our safe holds. They know where we are. Ooh, and that was dated three weeks ago. Sorry, Shantae. Ooh, right. Let's see what else we have here. Ah, the 40th annual Vampire Human Togetherness Luncheon will be happening in Toronto, Ontario on May 23rd. If you're a hunter who plans to attend, please refrain from eating garlic up to a week beforehand. Uh, get some concealer to cover up any cross tattoos you have, and make sure to get some vitamin D supplements because you will not be getting much sunlight. This year, we have special guest Gorgoroth the Insane from Hungary, who will be giving a special talk on making guacamole using fresh blood for a tasty snack, as well as demoing a human-friendly version using tomato juice. Thanks, Gorgoroth. All right, what else do we have here? Ah, I see we have a report from the hunter group Sons of the Sun. Well, that's a repetitive name. <laughs> All right, they've left us a report. We tracked it for weeks. We weren't sure what it was at first. It left dark footprints, like soot. Gwen thought it was some sort of chimney demon, but people don't have chimneys anymore. The monsters we face live in the world of white paint and drywall we've crafted around them. There is no gothic horror, only the soot footprints and flecks of blood on the thin gray carpeting. We haven't seen it yet, only followed its trail of desolation. The rooms it walks through smell smoky, but nothing has been burned that we can see. It's tall, it bumps its head on door frames, and its arms hang down low. The survivors, few they are, report that it makes a low sound and then a high-pitched one. The survivors never saw it directly. We don't know what it was, but we will continue following it and send another report next month. Wish us luck. We'll need it. Well, we certainly wish them all the best of luck. Hunting can be a dangerous job, but it is a worthwhile one. We can't always save lives, but sometimes we show up too late, like apparently I did here today. But we do our best, so push on, ever onward. I'll be here in the woods preparing our next broadcast. Till the next time, I'm Magpie Jones. Stay out safe out there, hunters. Now, a word from our sponsors, the Corundial Alien Invasion Fleet. Humans. They've had the run of the Earth for a long time. You might even be one of them. But are humans really the ruling force the world needs? <laughs> After all, have humans really done the greatest job at figuring out what to do for themselves? Can you honestly say humans are really the best masters of their own destinies? Seems like you guys mess it up a lot, doesn't it? Well, they'll let you in on a secret. Sometimes when alien, other alien species pass Earth, you can hear the car door locking sound. 
So why not try complete rule and oppression by the infinite Corundal Empire, master of 10,000 galaxies, at least a lot of which are actually populated? The Corundal Empire will not only take over your governments, economies, and lifestyles, but will take the hassle out of everyday problems. No more going to the grocery store, we'll ration you. Having love life trouble, no worries. We'll forcibly pair you off with another human as we mine your planet for resources. But guess what? Free dental care. Teeth are very important to us. We have nine mouths, after all. So say goodbye to free will and say hi to the Corundal Empire. If you surrender now, every human gets a cupcake. Sponsored by the Corundal Empire. All right, so as I said early in the show, we have stories in sci-fi, horror, and fantasy every week. So we've still got one left, fantasy. So here we go with the story that's in a little different vein. It's called The Queen of Cats. This was her realm. Her foot brushed the soft loam of the forest with a surreal quiet, as though the soles of her shoes were the pads of feline feet, and she waited till she was fully out of sight or earshot before she placed the mask on her face. Before that moment, the trees were just trees, and the animals were dull, and spoke only in mews, caws, and whimpers. But as soon as it touched her face, she felt the world open up around her. Her red hair parted, and the ears popped up under them, full of downy hairs and already wriggling to take in the sounds of the forest. Fur grew around her eyes, and in streaks up on her forehead, and a tail descended from her spine, flicking around as if it could stretch itself out after a long sleep. Queen Hopper, she heard Sir Puddlekin say, we were worried you wouldn't return. She smiled, raised her arm to the branch, and Sir Puddlekin dropped down and curled around her neck. What have I missed? Harper said, continuing on into the forest as Puddlekin grabbed a hold of the poofy shoulder of her dress with its paws. We need you to resolve the dispute between our people and the crows, my queen. Meow. She tried not to sigh and nodded curtly. Her eyes had grown wider and keener, and the forest was finally in focus. She could see up ahead the court was already assembling. The black cats, the tabbies, the tawnies, the cheshires. It looked like everyone was already there. Some dangled from tree branches while others had curled up for a nap before the meeting. Butterflies flew in shapes like flowers through the sky in celebration of the meeting of court. As she strode in, the cat's mewing turned into one thick, loud purr. She smiled and took her place in the clearing. <clears throat> Welcome, cats, kittens, and kin. Where are our guests? As if on cue, the black crows came down and landed on a branch in front of her, each belting out a squawky note as they landed in a rising scale, like an off-key piano. One of the crows shifted a few inches away from the others and cocked its head to the side. So, so, you're their queen, queen, queen. Birds always talked funny. It was one thing she wasn't quite used to yet. Yes, queen of the cats. I have to, have to, have to ask a girl, queen of the cats. There was some hissing. No disrespect, no disrespect. She smiled. Yes, I think you'll find they trust me as their queen. They chose me after all. She looked over at Sir Puddlekin and smiled. Sir Puddlekin limped from where the man had kicked him the thirst making his throat ache and itch, his vision fuzzy, fuzzy, and then black. You poor thing, he heard in the darkness. When he awoke, he saw her there, framed like an angel in the incandescent light, her grease-filled hair shining off the flickering bulbs. Her hands covered with grease burns and knife nicks were gently stroking him as he lay on a warm towel. There was a nice bowl of milk nearby, and as he strained to reach his head for it, she pushed it up to his face. He lapped it up and felt his thirst quench. Shh, it's all right, little kitty. She, he knew she was the one they had been looking for, and he mewed out the call. Throughout the darkness, cats raised their heads, and they knew the night had succeeded in his quest. Sally Harper woke up, not to the bleeding of her alarm like usual, but to the sound of an immense amount of meowing. Rubbing her eyes, she slid out of bed and went over to the glass sliding door in the room. Opening the curtains, she was met with an entire mess of cats, all mewing and meowing, stepping over each other to get a better view. But in front of one cat with striped fur, it was holding a 
mask in its mouth, its eyes keen and focused on her. Behind her leg, she felt the cat she'd taken in, purring and rubbing her leg. Looking down, the cat gestured towards the door. She wasn't supposed to have a cat in the apartment, let alone 50, but this was clearly not a normal set of circumstances. Sally opened the door, and the cats poured in, all colors and all kinds, circling around her and leaving a gap for the lead cat who approached her with a mask and held it up as high as he could, rearing up rampant on his hind legs. Sally took the mask and examined it. For something handed to her by a stray cat, it certainly was in good shape. It felt like a mask made of seashell, and it was inscribed with words. I am only a girl. When I wear this mask, I am a girl and cat. She held the mask gentle, aware that all the kitties were staring at her intently, far less distracted than she had ever seen a group of cats. Taking in a breath, she pressed the mask to her face and felt the changes instantly. Like Cinderella, her clothes glowed and swirled and her pajamas became the most beautiful of dresses. And as she looked in her reflection, she saw that she was indeed girl and cat. Ah, good. You can hear us now, the striped cat said. I am Lady Lux Adorable of the cats. A pleasure to meet you, Sally said, trying not to panic that the cat was in fact speaking to her or that she now had cat ears. Do not worry, the changes will disappear when you want them to. But you have been honored by our people. We wish for you to be our queen. Sally raised an eyebrow. Wait, wait, what? You want me to be a cat queen? What, what would I even do? Protect us. Bring us milk. Represent us. There are people, after all, who feel like it's their right to hurt our fellows, like the man who kicked Sir Puddlekin there. She looked down at the cat she'd been tending, who meowed, uh, I'm very thankful for your help. Right, uh, right. I'm, I'm dreaming, aren't I? The cat's laughed, a sound she wouldn't usually have thought of as laughter. No, but the choice is yours. You may be our queen or walk away from the opportunity. Sally smiled and stepped through the cats to the fridge, where she pulled out the quarter-empty gallon of milk, then a big bowl from the cabinet, and poured it all in, setting it down for the cats, who immediately began circling to lap it up. Well, my mom did always say she thought I'd turn out to be an old cat lady. May as well be a young one. So, what exactly is the problem here? My queen, these crows have been eating all of the pulse berries. The queen of cats looked at the heart-shaped berries that only grew in the secret forest of the kingdom of the cats. There certainly are a lot less of them. If they keep eating too many of them, they won't grow back, Sir Puddlekin added. We have new, new hatchlings. We can't feed them from trash from humans. They need berries, real food, real food. What, is that all? The birds looked at each other. All? Oh, big deal. Our children? Children? Sally smiled. Look, I'll, I'll be back in an hour. Don't fight or anything. I'll bring back enough berries for all of you. Not that much later, Sally was in line at the supermarket. Her cart filled up with strawberries, blueberries, and blackberries. All of the ones that the grocery store had in the <laughs> fruit section. The cashier gave her an odd look as she loaded them onto the conveyor belt. Wow, the guy said. His name tag said Josh. Roommate dispute. Long story. The guy just nodded and went back to scanning the berries. This is amazing! Amazing! The crows crowded around the cart full of plastic cartons of berries, which Sally opened up one at a time, letting the crows snap the berries out and fly off with. She would be sure to account for all the packaging. This was a special place, and nature deserved her respect. As the crows left... With the last of the berries, she saw each one cheekily grab the last pulse berry near her hand before flying off. The cats came back to her, rubbing gently against her, purring softly. The wind blew like a terse whisper against her face, and Sally looked up at the beautiful forest, full of cats and other animals, caterpillars on the leaves and birds in the air. Yes, this was a special place, and she'd keep it safe. After all, that was part of the job. Thank you. So, today we're ending off with a little program I like to call 
Jenny Hargrave, Space Commander. <laughs> Playing the role of Jenny Hargrave, our heroine is... Molly Southgate. All right. Here we begin. In the depths of space, a single space fighter drifts towards a derelict spacecraft. Its pilot is Jenny Hargrave. Space Commander, aided by her trusty bot, R.U.R., Jenny begins the docking sequence on her space fighter. That should do it, R.U.R. Looks like we made the seal. Can you open the hatch? <laughs> awesome. All right. Ugh. The air and stale. <sighs> yeah, okay. I should have figured that. But now we just have hope. No one else has found this thing. Before Austin raided the treasure. Let's look over by those crates. Hmm. Okay, not seeing anything. Wait, what's that? Ah! Don't hurt me! I'm Commander Jenny Harrograve, Centro Space Navy. Identify yourself. I'm Trevor. You don't look like Trevor. Well, that's probably because I'm a robot. Yeah, uh, I uh, noticed that. The whole being made of metal thing. R-U-R here seems to, to dislike you. R-U-R? Like the play, the one that invented the word robot? You should know that. Now what are you doing here? I'm the pilot. Of the ship? Of course, of the ship. This ship is ancient. You can't still have power. Wait, you... That's not why you're here. I'm here for the treasure? That is the treasure. What is? Ah, uh, follow me. I'll show you. The robot leads Jenny into another room of the spaceship, where a splinting black ball hangs in the center. She marvels at it. Oh. She marvels a little more. Oh. No, no, I, <laughs> no, I think it was better the first time. Get on with my story. <laughs> fine, fine. Jenny turns to Trevor, her eyes still filled with wonder at the strange orb. Do you know what that is? That's a black hole drive. They're super illegal but also super hard to get rid of. You can't easily dispose of them. Because of the whole, it's a black hole thing? Right. So... As Trevor explains the absolutely boring workings of a black hole engine to Jenny, we cast our gaze outside the ship to where sinister space pirates have arrived after following Jenny in secret for days. There she is. She thinks she can get whatever's in the ship? She doesn't know the Callisto carrion hawks. Yar. I'm setting up docking clamps, Captain. Uh, Captain? Yar? Why are we called the Callisto Carrion Hawks? Because we're from Callisto. I got that part. And you know... You don't know why we picked that name, do you? I killed the last captain. What do you expect? You could have changed your name. You know, then we'd have to repaint the ship, and that's hard. You know what Carrion is, right? Oh, yeah, totally. You tell me. I got no clue. It means rotting animals. Ooh. All right, we're renaming the ship. It's settled. After we capture this treasure. Yeah. <laughs> Trevor finishes explaining how the black hole drive works as Jenny hears something fishy. So basically, even the slightest destabilization would destroy everything in the surrounding area. Are those docking clamps? Well, it can't be. No one ever docks here. I'm here. Oh, right. Avast me, hearties. Commander Jenny, fancy seeing you here. Aye, it's been a long time since I saw ye, and ye took my eye. I did not take your eye. Stop exaggerating. You are exaggerating a little bit there, Captain. If you hadn't have been there shooting at me, I wouldn't have tried to reload my gun with the barrel pointing at me face. <laughs> his fault. Totally his fault. Yeah, that was irresponsible gun ownership. Silence! I will have my revenge, and I'll take this treasure. Your life is forfeit, Commander. You know what? You can have it. She walks up to the black sphere containing the black hole, picks up a wrench, and throws it at it. No! Don't do that! It's no use to me anyways. So, we can just have it? Yep, and I'll be on my way. All right then, sounds fair. The pirate captain walks up to the sphere. The dent where Jenny had thrown the wrench begins to glow. Run! Not questioning that! <laughs> they run for the starfighter. The ship begins to vibrate. The black hole beginning to escape its containment. The ship being torn apart from the inside. Captain, we'd better go to. I don't want to be carrying. They all ran, sprinting, their lungs burning. 
We're almost there. All right, quick, everyone inside. Strap yourselves in. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Get to the controls. We have to take off fast. Launch sequence ready in three, two, one. The ship rocketed off. The ship behind them ripped to pieces, then collapsed in on itself, sucking the light around it and devouring matter. We're almost out of uh, out of what will be. That thing's event horizon. Almost there, almost there. We're not gonna make it! One last push! They made it! Zooming out towards normal space. Home free. That was a wild ride. Did the pirates make it out? Probably. They always seem to. <laughs> so you've been on a ship for, th- for a few hundred years. Anywhere you'd like to see, Trevor? Honestly, I think I'd just like to listen to a radio show. Or a podcast. <laughs> I think we can arrange that. ROR, pop one in. You don't look excited. I don't need to listen to one. I lived it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to our great cast here. All right. So, Molly Southgate. You guys introduce yourselves real quick. Rob Southgate and Chris Mao. All right. Thank you. And, well, thank you. Well, that's all to, for tonight from the Blue Light. Come back next month where we'll be sure to offer you more tales of the fantastic into the darkest depths of your horror, the brightest flights of your fancy, and the biggest dreams of your future. From all of us here at the Blue Box Cafe in Elgin, Illinois, keep your light shining. There's plenty more to see. That's it. Thank you, everybody. We will be back in a month, third Saturday of every month. Tales by the Blue Light. I Tales guess. by the Blue Light. Oh, my yes. gosh. I'm going to get wrong every time. Second week, live at the Blue Box is here. And then there's lots of other stuff that Chris can inform you about. Uh, follow us on social media. Follow us on Periscope and Twitter and YouTube and everything else. Look for Southgate Media Group. Look for Tales by the Blue Light. Look for live at the Blue Box. And look for the Blue Box. And right. Look for Arc Beetle. And Man. Tales of the Blue Light Facebook page is now live, so that's good. You can, you Support can like Jim. Us. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Oh, Sherlock coming up momentarily. Yes, if you would like one of Jim's books, he does have them in the trunk. See this man. He's selling them. He's got 10,000 dogs. He's got his Doctor Who book. Uh, He probably has other stuff. And if you really want to buy some stuff out of his car, I'm sure he'll sell you just about anything. Yeah, it's out of the back of his van. No, it's in his car. If you'd like to...